Hello everyone, my name is Bradley and this is Thumbs Up, a channel about how to survive in the online jungle. Now surely you've already heard about the new star in the world of cybercrime, the hacker group Lapsus. They made headlines for the first time in December of 2021 when hackers successfully attacked the Brazilian Ministry of Health. The criminals actually copied over confidential information and demanded a ransom from the government for its non-disclosure. And then in less than three months, 19 more large companies became victims of Lapsus. For example, hackers downloaded and published 100 90 gigabytes of data from Samsung's corporate network and after their attack on Microsoft, the source code of some modules of the Bing search engine and the Cortana voice assistant appeared on the network too. Lapsus also hacked NVIDIA. They managed to steal the accounts of 70,000 users of the company and also download certificates confirming the security of drivers and software modules. Ubisoft and Vodafone also admitted that their corporate networks were successfully attacked by this group. The hackers here behaved like real rock stars. They boasted about their success in their Telegram channel, they generously shared stolen information, and according to Microsoft's experts, didn't make much effort to cover their tracks at all. It's not surprising, therefore, that on the 24th of March, the City of London Police detained seven alleged members of Lapsus. Another thing was quite surprising here. They all turned out to be under 21 years old. The leader of the group, who was known on the internet under the name of White Doxbin, was a 16-year-old from Oxford. Impressive, right? Well, now imagine that there were 300 Bitcoins in this guy's crypto wallet. And at that time, they are worth more than $14 million. I bet in your head you're already imagining some kind of computer genius who writes code in his mind and knows tens of thousands of pages of operating system reference books, right? Well, you'd actually be wrong. Lapsus is a new generation of hackers. After all, in the year of 2022, hackers don't actually have to be able to program. This is a screenshot from Reddit. On a popular and publicly available resource, the author of the message openly made an offer to employees of mobile operators to help with hacking clients of their companies. You see, the message explicitly talks about SIM swaps. Now, this is the name given to transferring a mobile phone number to a new SIM card. And this is a completely normal and acceptable operation. For example, if you lost your phone along with the SIM card, or maybe you decided to change your Nokia 3310 to an iPhone 13, right? But the guys from Lapsus were interested in SIM swapping to bypass two-factor authentication. And this was far from the only announcement in open sources. Hackers didn't even bother in using proxy server chains, data encryption methods, and all that I've already talked about more than once. Instead, they actively used Telegram and exchanged messages on forums openly. However, they still did actively use the darknet to purchase stolen user data. If the user's data couldn't be bought, Lapsus tried to steal them with the help of other people's programs, which are not difficult to find even in the open part of the internet. In the history of Lapsus, I was more interested in another question. Are they the first no-code hackers? Well, it turns out that no, not at all. After all, the first hackers didn't use computers at all. What do you think the first ever hackers did? That's right, they messed about with model trains. In November of 1946, two students at MIT founded the Tech Model Railroad Club. In those years, many young people were fond of these small model trains, but it was a very expensive pastime. And therefore, John Fitzalan Moore and Walter Marvin decided to join forces to share the costs in building a unique mock-up of a railway on campus. Their friends liked the idea, and it attracted several different teams in a matter of months. Some students became interested in creating miniature buildings, others in replicating real trains and wagons. But the most difficult engineering task was faced by the students who automated the work of the model. They tried to control things like the movement of trains, the switching of arrows, and the operation of semaphores with the help of complex relay chains. Students used parts from telephone exchanges and spent hours developing schemes for their connection. It was then that the word hack appeared in their vocabulary. It meant a kind of unusual and elegant technical solution to a problem. And soon, the students ended up calling each other hackers. And a few years later, this word was adopted by their friends, who worked with the first ever computers. By the early 60s, the layout of the railway was controlled by a system of 1,200 relays, and routes and train schedules were calculated in advance using a real mainframe. The layout has survived to this day, however now it's controlled by four dozen microcontrollers. So if you're at MIT, make sure to take a look at this masterpiece. Unfortunately, the founder and first president of TMRC is rarely remembered when talking about the first ever hackers. But John Moore did go down in history as the creator of the world's first CT scanner, 
I wonder how many hacks from this railway layout were used in this device. So look, as you can see, initially the word hacker didn't carry any negative connotations at all. In the 60s, you had to save every bit of memory you could, every clock cycle of the processor, and therefore non-standard tricks helped to squeeze more out of computers than their creators could ever imagine. Every time I think about that era, this photograph of Margaret Hamilton appears before my eyes. This girl is a real hacker from MIT, and in this picture she poses with one of the most famous programs of the 20th century. This huge stack of paper is a printout of the software for the Apollo 11 spacecraft. For the first time in history, Margaret thought about ensuring the ultra-reliable operation of computers. A significant part of the code consists of things like error recognition and correction algorithms. And Margaret's caution here actually saved the lives of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Let me explain. Three minutes before landing on the moon, the computer began to receive incorrect signals from the radar, which monitored the position of the module remaining in orbit. This information was ultimately needed to return to orbit in case of, say, a termination of the landing. Errors began to accumulate and threatened to take up the tiny memory of the computer. But the Hamilton program recognized the critical situation and warned the astronauts about it with the historic Alarm 1202. The computer turned off the process and solved this problem of RAM over Flow. This was a giant leap for a computer whose RAM was about four kilobytes. The Eagle has landed. Roger, twin. Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys about to turn blue. We're breathing again. Thanks a lot. Now you can still appreciate the beauty of this program today. Five years ago, enthusiasts posted it on GitHub. If you're down with assembly code, you can find the link in the description. Do you remember how a few years ago, if you would type a few characters in the Indian language Telugu into your iPhone, it would cause it to reboot? Well, the core text system was to blame here, which was responsible for displaying unusual characters on the screen. This sequence of glyphs forced the system to try to do what it literally could not do, display a non-existent symbol, and created an infinite number of graphemes as a result. Cortex quickly started using all of the free amount of RAM. The phone tried to close the dangerous process and close the phone's desktop as a result. But back to the history of hackers. While some dreamed of the moon, others were just looking for vulnerabilities in our surroundings. What do you think an automatic telephone exchange and cornflakes might have in common? Frequency. In 1970, the computer world was ruled by huge and expensive mainframes. There were still five years left, by the way, before the experience of the first Altair 8800 personal computer. Only 13 nodes were connected to ARPANET, which would turn into the internet some years later. Telephone lines, therefore, remained the main means of communication. But conversations between different cities in America were not cheap. And of course, people tried to cheat the phone companies. The first example of this was done by a five-year-old child Joseph Carl Ingressier was blind from birth. The physical disadvantage was compensated by a fine musical ear. One day, Joseph heard strange sounds in the telephone receiver. With their help, the phone and the automatic telephone exchange traded service signals. So the system received information about the end of the conversation and gave permission to make a long distance call. Joseph learned to simulate these high frequency signals. And at the right moment, he whistled into the phone and got one opportunity to chat with pretty much anyone all over the country for free. In the late 60s, whilst he was in college, Joseph shared his secret with his friends, and soon information about his unusual abilities attracted the attention of telephone companies, FBI agents, and even the press. Young people across the country started to experiment with their phones. They tried to record service signals using tape recorders and were looking for ways to simulate such signals. Unexpectedly, and here's where Cornflex comes in, the simplest tool for this became a children's toy. This is the Boatswain's Pipe, which was found enclosed in boxes of Cap and Crunch Cornflakes. By coincidence, the pipe made a sound at a frequency of 2600 hertz. The same frequency was coincidentally used by AT&T to indicate that a trunk line was available for routing a new call. And this made it possible to, you guessed it, make free calls. And this is how a plastic toy gave way to the freakers movement. Now this word is derived from a combination of the words freak and frequency. In October 1971, an article by Rosen Rosenbaum titled Secrets of the Little Blue Box was published in Esquire magazine. And this article is based on an interview with John Draper, who created one of the first electronic devices that aimed to mimic the tone signals of telephone exchanges. First thing I would do is I would blow uh, this.
Draper quickly became a star of the Freakers movement and subsequently got charged with fraud. In 1972, the court found him guilty and sentenced him to a suspended sentence of five years. But this didn't discourage Draper at all, and he continued sharing his knowledge with other enthusiasts, in particular with Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. In those years, the future founders of Apple tried to establish their own production of blue boxes. Draper would continue to collaborate with Jobs, and in 76, he would work on a system for connecting the Apple II to telephone lines. And in 1979, he'd write the first word processor for this very computer. Freakers became the first ever scammers who used their knowledge to benefit from the illegal use of complex electronic systems. Their ideology and way of thinking became the basis for the division of hackers into white hats and black hats. By the early 80s, personal computers were no longer something of a curiosity. Thousands of people across America were becoming interested in programming and exploring the possibilities of the first ever computer networks. The spirit of the era was personified by a new hero, Neil Patrick. At just 17, he appeared on the cover of Newsweek magazine, gave an interview with Phil Donahue, and became a guest of CBS Morning News. Neil was the voice of hacker group 414. 414 never tried to cover its tracks. Even the name contributes to their de-anonymization. The founders of the group live in Milwaukee, and 414 is just the phone code of their area. Doesn't it sound a lot like lapsus? Only the 414s never considered themselves criminals at all. Their activities weren't aimed at making profits. They didn't try to transfer money from someone else's accounts or steal confidential information. They were just interested in the opportunities that new technologies could open up. And within just one year, hackers were bypassing the security systems of Pacific National Bank and even the nuclear laboratory in Los Alamos. The hackers, of course, acted carelessly. During the hacking of the Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, they accidentally deleted part of the accounting documentation. The clinic estimated damage to be around $1,500, and of course, in our times, it's not much money, but this incident is what made it possible for federal authorities to arrest the hackers. At that time, there were no laws against hacking, so adult participants of 414 were charged with telephone hooliganism. At what point did you first question the ethical propriety of what you were doing? Once the FBI knocked at my door. So, so it was... They were threatened with two years of probation and a fine of $500. But in the end, the charges against the hackers were dropped altogether. The story of the 414s draws public attention to computer security issues. Governments of different countries ended up drafting various laws aimed at countering cybercrime. Developers and engineers in large companies began learning how to counteract intruders. If they used to struggle with the limitations of their own computers, now the main problem is the malicious intent of other people. In classic westerns, good heroes could be distinguished from the criminals by the color of their hats. The officers of the law wore white, while the bandits wore black. In the digital world, black hats seek to gain illegal access to other people's systems, most often for the sake of money and power. White hats, on the other hand, help companies identify weaknesses in their systems and protect themselves and others from black hats. In the 90s, the gap between the opposing camps grew. There were more and more computers, hundreds of thousands of new users began connecting to the network, and journalists subsequently began to frighten ordinary people with the horrors of the digital world. And Hollywood studios were shooting more and more films, the main characters of which were computer criminals. Get away from the computer. What did you think you were trying to do? Save the world? No, not the world, just myself. At this point in time, the income of black hats was already measured in the hundreds of thousands. For example, in 1993, Kevin Poulsen hacked into a computer with which a radio station in Los Angeles held contests with its listeners. Kevin manipulated the results and twice received the main prizes, a Porsche 944. Who didn't dream of such a cool car as a child? Imagine how Paulson's story resonated in the hearts of boys all over America, and most of them didn't want to spend hours learning how to program. Thousands of teenagers were looking for easy ways to become hackers quickly. So a new kind of hacker began to appear in the digital jungle, the script kiddie. This name was used to describe low-skilled, malicious users. They used scripts and utilities written by other people to attack other people's networks and programs. Often a script kiddie or a skiddy doesn't even understand how these scripts work, but it's simple enough for them to just download the first program they find on the web and carry out everything exactly according to the instructions. Unlike conventional hackers, regardless of whether they're white or black, our script kiddie is not looking for new knowledge at all. They're not interested in how the network works. They need a result, and they need it here and now. It doesn't have to be money or a valuable prize. Often, it's just enough for them to hack a random website on the web and upload their nickname to its main page. Funny? Actually, no, not really. 
The US's Department of Defense's script Kitty Report described it as the more immature, but unfortunately often just as dangerous, exploiter of security lapses on the internet. In 2015, a British VPN provider conducted a curious experiment. The company's specialists asked a seven-year-old Betsy Davies to try and hack a public Wi-Fi hotspot. Now, the girl spent 10 minutes and 57 seconds to find the necessary video tutorial on YouTube, and then she was able to replicate it completely. As a result, she managed to raise a fake access point and carry out a classic man-in-the-middle attack to intercept traffic from a participant's laptop. Now, of course, naivety and inexperience often play against such hackers. Under the guise of combat programs, they often download viruses and trojans that steal their own data. Or, as happened with the popular torrent client, they're engaged in work for their creators. They mine in cryptocurrency or become an element of a bot network. In defense of the script kitty, I must say that for some, it's only a transitional stage, the first step on the path to a real hacker. By the way, do you know what Kevin Paulson is doing now? Well, he continues to inspire novice hackers, but in a completely different way. In 1991, he was arrested for telephone fraud and sentenced to five years in prison. But after that, Paulson became one of the most famous IT journalists in the world as the editor of Wired magazine. In the 2010s, more and more software manufacturers began to move away from selling their products in boxes towards the ideology of software as a service, or SAS for short. Cloud data storage, photo and video editing tools. After all, do you remember the last time you used offline tools to work with texts? The model of buying a service rather than a license has conquered the business community and investors. Of course, hackers didn't stay away here either. Attackers have learned how to make money by selling their services using the SAS model. Now it's enough to make a couple of requests to Google to get access to modern marketplaces where you'll be offered access to tools for attacking competitors, labor exchanges for hackers, or detailed instructions on hacking other people's resources, for instance. With the help of such services, non-professionals are able to organize attacks that far exceed their qualifications. Novice cybercriminals now just need to have the desire and some money in order to, say, perform a DDoS attack, block someone else's phone, hack an account, create a phishing site, or even launch a unique kind of virus. You know, the most unusual thing that I came across when I was looking for materials for this video is the existence of ransomware programs that work according to an SAS model and require only a percentage of the ransom received. It's a good business, considering that in 2020, the average size of the buyout was about $170,000. $70,000. However, even with the help of such services, you obviously won't just become a hacker. The hacker's path is a constant study of the world around him, the search for unusual moves and unlocked doors. This is a way of thinking and the ability to compare facts, to hear the tone of a control signal and a children's whistle, to watch how the letters of a complex alphabet can disable a smartphone and learn how to control trains using even mechanical relays. In any case, my name is Bradley and thanks for tuning in to our weekly show here at SumSub. I will see you in the next video. Thanks for joining us.